When Jesus saw his ministry drawing huge crowds, he climbed a hillside. And those who were apprenticed to him, those who were committed, they climbed along with him. And arriving at a quiet place, he sat down and taught his climbing companions. And this is what he said. You're blessed when you're at the end of your rope, because with less of you, there is more of God. You're blessed when you feel you've lost what is most dear to you. Only then can you allow yourself to be embraced by the one who is most dear to you. You're blessed when you're content with just who you are, no more, no less. That's the moment you find yourself the proud owner of everything that can't be bought. You're blessed when you've worked up a good appetite for God. He's food and drink in the best meal you'll ever have. You're blessed when you care. The moment you find yourself full of care is the moment you'll find yourselves cared for. And you're blessed when you get your inside world, your heart and your mind put right. Then you can see God in the outside world. You're blessed when you can show people how to cooperate instead of compete or fight. That's when you discover who you really are and your place in God's family. And you're blessed when your commitment to being and doing this way in the world, your commitment to God, provokes persecution. That persecution drives you even deeper into God's kingdom. And know that you're in good company because my prophets and my witnesses have always gotten into that sort of trouble. So that's this morning's gospel, the same, but a little different. Because it's a translation from a Bible called The Message, a translation written by the Presbyterian pastor, Eugene Peterson, who started and founded one of the largest Presbyterian churches, Christ the King, over in Bel Air, Maryland, where he pastored for 30 years. And at some point in his ministry there, he sensed that the scripture was getting so rote and so familiar that people couldn't hear it anymore. They had no relationship with the text, like something you pass by and see every week and you just start to take it for granted. So he said, I'm going to sit down, I'm going to translate the New Testament for myself. I went to seminary. I got those Greek classes. And his intention was to re-engage that relationship so that Jesus sounds like a person who is sitting there with you and speaking in our language. And the other day I was listening to Peterson. He's now in his 80s, retired. I was listening to him being interviewed and he was sharing what he tells people when people ask him about where they should go to church when they're church shopping. And he said, this is what you do. You find the smallest church in your neighborhood and you go there for six months. And if you really can't take it after six months, then go find the next smallest church in your neighborhood and spend six months there. Because if you have any interest in knowing God and being in relationship with God through Jesus Christ, then you simply have to deal with people as they are. And you've got to learn to love them when they're not lovable. And I would say the same is uh, true, vice versa. Meeting people where they are and loving them because of where they are or in spite of where they are seems to me exactly what Jesus does as he walks along his way. And that's something Paul tries to remind his little church in Corinth in these letters to the Corinthians. It's a church where people are arguing over who to follow. Do I follow Apollos or Paul or Cephas? They're arguing over who and how they're supposed to eat food. They're arguing over who should and shouldn't be married or whether or not they're supposed to be married at all. They are a group of people trying to figure out what church is supposed to be. What is church in the midst of a city that has parties of every kind, distractions for all sorts of tastes, and plenty of temples to choose from. And the gist of Paul's letter is, be what you already are. You are blessed. You are saints. You are literally a temple that holds the Holy Spirit. So be that. 
Stop acting selfishly and start acting selflessly, examining your individual behaviors to see whether or not they are a part of building up the body and working towards the common good. Now, Corinth was a city that was destroyed by the Roman Empire in about 146 BCE. And then the Roman Empire decided to rebuild it in 44 BCE. And they rebuilt it the way the British Empire built Australia. They sent everybody they didn't want there. They sent the prisoners and the slaves, all the dregs of society that they wanted out. They sent them to Corinth. And Paul gets there about 100 years later. And by that time, of course, they've made their own economy. And it is a thriving hub in the Greco-Roman world. Friday night, I was down at Fells Point, and it was hopping. And I imagine a Friday night in Corinth wouldn't have been much different. This is why we hear Paul remind the Corinthians of where they came from. Consider your own call, brothers and sisters, or a different translation. Take a look, friends, at who you were when you got here. When you are called into this life, I don't see many of the best and the brightest amongst you. I don't see many of the influential. I don't see many from high society families. And yet God deliberately chose you to show the world something important. That what the world reveres as smart and powerful is not the same as the wisdom and power of God. And in fact, there are ways of God that are just downright foolish. Because of that, or in spite of that, that is where our deepest blessings are. Did you all have a fabulous time in middle school and high school? I had a hard time in middle school and high school. I can remember, like it was yesterday, writing in my diary every single year. Dear diary, this is the year I'm getting in with the popular kids. I couldn't see that I was six feet tall and had giant Coke bottle glasses, and that was never going to happen. <laughs> It's so hard because our adolescence is this time when we stop looking to our parents as being the purveyors of how we should be, and we start looking to our peer group. The crowd we run with becomes the most important aspect of cultivating our identity. And most of us put a high priority on fitting in, getting into the right social clique, and trying to join that popular crowd. Now, in all of Paul's letters, but especially this one, he is saying, brothers and sisters, it is time for us to grow up out of that. Stop worrying about fitting in with the crowds and realize you are a community that is set apart. We aren't better than anyone else, but we do things differently than everyone else does. Because we're children of God, we're saints of God, our bodies are temples within which dwells the Holy Spirit. And we are called to see strength in weakness and mercy. And we are called to find wisdom in the foolishness of loving other people the way God loves. Now Jesus begins his ministry in Galilee by going right to the poor and the sick and the lame and the demon possessed, forming relationships with people who are really used to being ignored. No wonder word gets out. He is bringing healing and hope to the forgotten. Besides this crowd that's been following him since Galilee, we read that there are about 10 towns from across the lake and others from Jerusalem and Judea and still others from across the Jordan who join in this crowd and march. And it's when Jesus sees these huge crowds, climbs a hillside to talk to the smaller committed group. Why does Jesus do that? Why doesn't he take advantage of this momentum? Because as Jesus will reiterate throughout his entire life, he knows that the crowds know that the message of the cross is foolishness. And it's not what people are hoping for. You're blessed when you're at the end of your rope. You're blessed when you feel you've lost what's most important. You're blessed when you're content with who you are. You're blessed when you care. You're blessed when you get your mind and heart and your inside right. You're blessed when you show people how to cooperate. And you're blessed when your commitment to being that person in the world provokes 
persecution. It is very hard on this side of the Christian timeline as an established and accepted and kind of taken for granted religious tradition that has a fading institutional power to remember that our scripture was experienced and written by the dregs of society, like Jesus, like the people who followed him, like the people who started a church in Corinth. Our sacred text, our good news, is a history of people who never get to write. And surely that is some clue for us as to what the wisdom of God, these beatitudes, these teachings, we hear Jesus describe a kingdom that would never be popular, a kingdom of poor, broken, lost, weak, and foolish people. And the prophets, the people Jesus says that you and I already are. And because becoming what we already are has always been and always will be such hard and holy work, we find communities that are set apart where we can engage in the work together. Where together we wrestle with these words and our relationship with God and with the teachings of Jesus, with together we wrestle with what it means when we say at the end of this service, send us out into the world in peace, yet with strength and courage to love you with singleness of heart. We wrestle with what it means to know we are blessed, that God loves us as we are, yet loves us too much to leave us that way. Church is a body of relationships brought together by God through Jesus Christ. It is a community of people that Sunday by Sunday and days in between step back from the crowds to remember that we have all these blessings and all God desires from us is that we encourage and support one another in proclaiming Christ crucified or translated differently, the foolishness of doing justice, loving kindness, and walking humbly with God.